Um, okay, anybody else have anything they want to put out? Hiring for anything or uh, looking for a job? Anything? Any news? I'm looking for a job developer. Are you Brandon? I am. Oh, okay, I was wow. asking if you were here earlier. He posted uh, on, on cool. the discussion board. Oh, okay. Remote work. I highly yep. recommend remote work. It's really fun. Yep. You want to say anything? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, yeah, for you. Yeah. We're looking for Java developers. Um, we use Spring, Java, Elasticsearch. Um, I don't know if that covers Postgres. The company covers looking really like security oriented. And Yes, yeah, uh, I guess I should start there. I work for FishMe, and we do a lot of research into phishing, malware, that kind of thing. Um, and we're growing. Uh, they added, I say they because I work for another company that they just acquired. Um, and we grew by about 100 people last year, doubling the size of the company. So wow. we're growing. Uh, it's a pretty cool company to work for. I've enjoyed it since October. Nice. Uh, but yeah, and cool. we're looking to expand our, our dev group. So awesome. And I'll be at Fox and the Hound as well. So. Awesome. That sounds good. <laughs> Are you good at pool? <laughs> I am terrible at pool. Alright. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to throw out there? Alright. I can't think of oh, oh quick question, Wi Fi? How am I uh, Oh John, do you know that we don't yes. I always ask John to handle okay. that I can I'll talk him through it, go ahead. Alright, yeah. Um okay. <clears throat> I can't think of anything else. If you haven't been here before, software craftsmanship. We just try to talk to each other about how to do our jobs better and um, be better craftsmen. Um, platform agnostic. We've been around a few years now. Um and uh, it seems like there's a lot of good groups that are popping up around the area now, too. So I'm going to try to get out to some of those. But uh, that's about it. I'm going to talk about the four rules of simple design. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Brandon Joyce, and I work for Cover My Meds. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the four rules of simple design apply to complex software. And I think that. Uh, the four rules of simple design are, are kind of like, I guess the subtitle here is kind of a, a misnomer. I mean, they're only there as rules because, because software is complex, but I kind of like to make the case that where I'm working now has, I think, a more complex problem than I'm used to solving because it's just like not your typical website kind of thing or anything. It's very complex uh, healthcare workflows that are terrible. <laughs> And uh, we're integrating all these different uh, people that don't use data the same way. And it just becomes really hard to solve that problem and keep your code readable and maintainable. So I'm going to try to talk about it from that perspective. But I think that these rules apply to really any code that you're looking at where you're trying to decide how to design it, trying to make a decision between maybe one pattern or another. I think that if you were to boil down all the solid principles and all the principles and patterns you've looked at, you could boil them down to these four rules are fundamental um, for those decisions. So anyway, um, <clears throat> this is Cover My Meds. Kind of similarly, uh, they've grown like crazy. I joined um, just under two years ago, and uh, I think had less than 20 devs. I was the first remote dev, and now they've got over 100 devs. So it's growing like crazy, which is certainly lends to what I'm talking about with the complexity of growing this huge system and adding new people all the time. Uh, it, it can be pretty tough. Um, <clears throat> but you know, we do the best we can. Um, just for high level on what we do, I guess Ruby and Rails uh, is like 90 5% of our system pretty much. Um, we do pair programming, test driven development, we're pretty um, pretty hardcore about that stuff, I think. Um, and we have a lot of remote devs. So I'm a remote dev, I live around here. They're based in Columbus, but they actually are opening an office, it's already open now actually, it's in Cleveland. So if you're looking for maybe something new, you wanna learn some Ruby, or you're interested. If you live as far away as Canton, you could probably even just be a remote dev, you wouldn't even have to go so if you have questions about that, let me know. It's a really good company. Um, <clears throat> and we solve this, I 
touched on it. Uh, healthcare process that's terrible. Uh, if you've ever had to do a prior authorization when you go to get your drugs from, you know, CVS or wherever, um, it's this this process where the insurance company wants you to authorize even further, get more information. Essentially, the expensive drugs they want to make sure that your doctor. Um, is prescribing the right drug that you need and that they really should pay for it. Um, <clears throat> we automate that process and I'd be happy to talk about it in more detail. It's not too important for here. <clears throat> so, like I said, we have a complex product and um, that's why we make a ton of money on it because it's not easy to do, right? But that doesn't mean we need a complex design. So I don't think those two things are equal, although a lot of times they are, right? You'll look at some complex thing that somebody's doing and their code is just like, ugh, oh, it's a genius wrote this. Like, how do they even do this? I, I can't follow it. It's hard to change. Um, and I think that simple software design enables simple humans to maintain this like, complex systems. If you were to take the whole of what we have now at where I work, it's like there's no way that I understand it all. But by following the rules, I can kind of cut little cake slices out and I can understand that really well and I can blend to you know, I can help for the greater good, basically. <laughs> um, here's the four rules. I'm going to go over these in a sec. So I gave this talk at CodeMash, and um, I haven't practiced it since then, so uh, this is informal and stuff, too. So like, if you want to stop me and talk about something, maybe you got a question about uh, what I'm talking about applies to what you're doing, just stop me and we'll talk about it. Um, or any questions, whatever you want to do. Totally cool. So there, these are the four rules. How many people have heard of the rules before? Awesome. There's a lot of people hearing about this for the first time. It's totally cool. Um, they've been around for a couple decades. Uh, Kent Beck kind of coined the, the, four, the, the four rules in his extreme programming principles. Um, you can still find that website. Um, it's kind of like one of the first versions of Agile, I guess. Um, still really good stuff in there. And uh, these rules don't get talked about as much as things like the solid principles and patterns and things like that. But like I said, <clears throat> I think you can consider these the fundamentals, really. So the four rules are one, the tests pass, which implies you have tests. Um, two, expresses intent. Does it do what it says it does? Can I read it and get the picture? What is it doing? No duplication. You may have heard that as the dry principle. Caveat with that is a lot of people mistake that for repeated code and reuse and things like that. And I think that's way less important than thinking of it as repeated business knowledge. Um, it's nice to kind of clean up your code and, and have you know, a more concise algorithm for things. But more importantly, you don't want to have a piece of business logic duplicated in two places. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of talk about some examples of that. I have some actual code examples, so we'll talk about that. And small, <clears throat> small meaning it fits in my head, and I'm not a genius. So, um, certainly relative, but some size of thing that the people on your team can eat in one sitting, basically, right? Um, and these are actually the version, the version that you're looking at here came from Corey Ains' book on the title, Understanding the Four Rules of Simple Design. Corey actually came to my talk at CodeMesh, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, I recommend the book. It's really good. It's about his experience traveling around and uh, doing code days. Uh, call it the uh, code retreat. Code retreat. Yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> I went to the very first one of those. I was really lucky and just like I kind of knew Corey he used to live in Cleveland, and I went to it. And there was all these really awesome people there who are like kind of nerd famous now. And uh, it was neat. Um, and then it became like this crazy thing that's all around the world. Um, so if you're you're interested in, you should look it up. That's a, a pretty cool event. It's like a day where you just write code, throw it away after after about an hour, and they usually do common scheme of life. But you get to pair with a lot of people and solve the problem different ways. Anyway, that's uh, something to look into. So these four rules, <clears throat> what I find interesting about them is they're not technical at all. They're about humans, which makes sense because we're human, not computer. Uh, so when I think of test passing, I feel like that gives me confidence. So I can run a, uh, a test suite and have confidence that things are working correctly. 
expresses intent, informs me, it says, it, it says in my language what's going on. Uh, no duplication, avoids confusion. I don't try to change something and then realize it needs to be changed in two places and I don't understand why. Um, I don't come across two business processes and like get confused about why is it in two places. <laughs> uh, small fits in my head. So I already kind of talked about that. And <laughs> sub bullet point, beware of geniuses. And that's really to the, the relativity of it, right? So, you know, if you're a one man team, uh, for a while, you could probably, small might be a little bit bigger for you. Um, but when you start interacting with other people, it's important to understand what is small to them and what, you know, what method sizes make sense. Uh, and more than method sizes, like systems, right? Because you grow as a company and it becomes, that small thing that you built becomes this massive thing and people just can't grasp the concept anymore, especially newcomers, right? So, you know, when you become that genius that knows how everything works and nobody else does, that's a problem. <clears throat> All right. So test pass. Obviously, if I were to pull down a complex product, Rails run RSpec and I see this, I feel no confidence at all about changing this code. I just like, like well, <laughs> I'm gonna need a month just to go like wrap this thing with testing of some type. Expresses intent, come across this, says it's gonna cook some spaghetti and it does nothing of the sort, it's completely unrelated. These are completely contrived examples, but it's just examples, right? Like that'd be pretty easy to avoid. But as your system grows, this stuff happens. You get a method name and somebody asks you to change something and you have maybe a few more lines here, it does more than the method name says now. Or maybe the class, or maybe the system. Okay, no duplication. So this is kind of another contrived example. We've got this important business workflow that does these three steps. Then we've got this other method here. It does the same thing and then celebrates. And you would say, obviously, like I said, this is a simple example, why wouldn't why wouldn't we call the other method and not duplicate those steps? Easy to see here, but you get really large systems and you start having the leaves. People didn't know that someone else did the same thing, solved the same business problem, and you can miss those things more easily for sure. Okay, small. <laughs> that text is really small. <laughs> so, this is. Remember that Node.js project I was talking about? Yep. This is like my, this is my terrible code. Um, like I totally admit that. And I knew where to go. I was like, I need to find some terrible code. I know where I did some terrible code. It was in this project. You don't even need to read that code and you know it's terrible. You can tell by the shape and size of it that it's just <laughs> going to take all day to read through and know what it does. So you don't, you don't need to know what patterns I'm using there or anything. You just know it's too big. <clears throat> Okay, so let's talk about building a complex product. It starts out not complex at all, right? It's like super easy. You just start throwing stuff in your Rails app and you're good to go, no problem. And actually, totally valid, right? Like the company I work at had a monolithic PHP app that made all their money. So, yay, good to go. But that, you know, starts to slow down over time. So, you know, you get going and and then boom, you've got spaghetti. It's hard to follow, hard to maintain, hard to get everybody up to speed. So, what do you do? Break down the spaghetti problem into smaller spaghetti problems? That kind of helps, but it's really more than that, right? You're just having, you know, more terrible code and just split apart. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess um, one of the biggest uh, things I wanted to get across is that it's not just about the code. I think that these four rules apply to the entire company at the organization um, level and at the system level and at the code level. And probably some stuff in between. I don't know what to call it though. Um, but at the organization level, they say you want to structure your organization the way you want your architecture to be, which I think makes sense. It's kind of in the vein of like if you want something done, make it somebody's job. I mean, uh, you know, 
you might split your company in two, right? If you're ser serving two different customers or something like that. Um, here's an example. This is kind of how, actually I think there's probably more verticals now, but this is kind of what we decided to do about a year ago at Cover My Meds. Uh, we had a lot of core APIs, a lot of apps and repositories that everyone would go in and maintain. <clears throat> um, but it became clear that each person was, each project was serving certain clients. And the needs of those clients would differ from, from going to EHR, pharmacy, to PBMs. And so you could see those concerns clashing a lot in the code. You could see somebody saying, I need to do it this way. The other person saying, actually, what's more important to do it that way. And so we realized in order to get the code and the structure of our apps kind of up to snuff, we really need to start at the company level. Um, so now everyone is assigned to a vertical. I'm actually on EHR currently. I'm going to be moving to a core tech team. We're, we're building a core tech team. Maybe I'll talk about that at the end because I think that's helped us to, it's going to help us to further grow and stuff. Um, but anyway, I'm on EHR, so when I'm looking at code, I know who I'm serving. When I talk about a piece of data, I know what direction it's going in, um, and I know you know who it's for, I know where I get the data from, uh, because we work with the same data. Like you know, you work with a patient, or you work with like there's a, this is a terrible standard, but uh, it's like a PA initiation request, right? That means something in the EHR land. It's kind of different from what it means in PBM. So. It's like if you were to look at code that worked with that same data, it's hard to get the context of what you're really doing until you know this is the init request from the EHR, or this is the init request that's going out to the payer. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm talking about. The other thing I just want to, I mean, I, could, I think we could give a whole talk on GitHub, but a lot of our flexibility uh, and ability to talk about these systems is empowered through GitHub. We do, um, you know, pretty strong code reviews. Um, everybody works in a pair, but you also have to get code reviewed from somebody else. Um, and that's great, though, because it's really not that hard, and it solves a lot of our auditing issues. So we don't have to really go outside of our process to do some, you know, crazy requirement that big companies care about, right? We can get up, solves that all for you. It gives you a really nice way to show a history of who looked at what and approved what basically just do commenting thumbs up kind of stuff, so it's, it's basically signing off. And we could talk about some more of the GitHub stuff if you guys have questions on it. Um, so you drill in, right? You drill into the organization and then you've got systems. And systems kind of have the same, same thing. You want to find good bounded contexts. Um, is anybody familiar with Domain Driven Design? It's a pretty good book. I think it's mostly done in Java. Uh, Eric Evans. It's a, I think they call it the blue book because it's, it's actually blue, but if you just get the electronic version, you wouldn't know. Um, anyway, uh, it talks a lot about modeling your systems after the domain. What does your business do? Make a code, use the same naming, and all that. Um, and it talks about bounded context. It's so important because if you divide up your system into multiple, say, microservices, or whatever you want to call it, right? Multiple repositories solving different problems. If at some point you find that you didn't really need to split two of them up, it's like, you know, that's a pain. You have to fix it and maybe combine them. So you want to be really thoughtful and get a lot of your team's opinion on what the bounded contexts are. Where, where does it make sense for us to pull all this functionality into a box and encapsulate it? And it doesn't have to be microservice, meaning it's running in a different web server or something like that. It's just got to be something that's encapsulated and doesn't reach too far, right? Like some way of modularizing things. So I'm starting to see these, I guess, concentric circles, right? Like as I want to understand something, you've got the whole company's one big circle. You've got verticals that are circles that you drill into, and then you've got systems you can drill into. And if all of that makes sense and is named properly, somebody that is new should be able to come onto the come onto the team and say, "Well, they're asking me to change this. Can I pretty easily drill into where that code is that's responsible for that?" 
this sort of hierarchy, I guess. Okay, so this is a product that I've worked on for the last like year or so. We do a lot of work in this. It's obviously more involved than just one project, but really its responsibility is taking in this XML standard I kind of have mentioned uh, from hospitals that use the standards integration. We take that XML in, we map it to JSON, uh, because most of our internal stuff uses JSON for communication, for now anyway. Um, and then it does the reverse. We get data back out from the payer and stuff, and we transfer it back into the XML that would make sense to the EHR system. So we're doing.